Not mythical vampires, but acutely attuned to the echoes of the deep. Not legendary krakens, yet lingering beneath the surface, poised for a calculated movement. They're orcas, not mere mythical fables, but living, breathing realities as tangible as you and I. Tilikum and Katsaka, once souvenirs of the deep, now navigate the shadowy realms of confinement, where dazzling performances mass a cryptic reality. The waters ripple with the echoes of their discontent, as these majestic creatures, once awe-inspiring symbols, become agents of disquiet. Trainers and onlookers become unwitting characters in gruesome attacks, which change the perception of marine captivity forever. Prepare yourself for some of the most horrific attacks of killer whales on those foolish enough to enter the tanks of the wrongful captive. Ken Peters had worked as a trainer for 11 years, but he never expected to be attacked during his career at SeaWorld. As the female orca, Katsuka, dragged him under, he couldn't stop thinking that this was how his life would end. The orca continued toying with him, thrashing him around in the water and dragging him to the bottom of the pool three times. People watched in horror as the agitated whale attacked him. Ken desperately tried to escape, but Katsuka would not let go. With only fractions of a second left, before Ken would lose his life, an idea suddenly emerged, one that would soon become his lifeline. Since the first orca named Shamu performed at SeaWorld San Diego in 1960, there has never been a year without an incident. The marine park famous for its killer whale performances in Orlando and San Diego has often been criticized for the deadly risk they pose to humans, but the park went ahead anyway. These were almost 22-foot-long, 5,000-pound animals captured brutally from their environment, the vast expanses of the ocean, to live in tiny tanks, which often took a toll on their mental health. However, it was a problem that the authorities and trainers just didn't care to acknowledge. The success and thrill of the amazing orca performances were echoed every time by the fascinated crowds yelling Shamu, in an ironic salute to an animal who despised being there. Ken Peters had been trained well and his experience had paid off on November 29, 2006. There had been countless incidents involving the female orca, Katsuka. She had bumped, bitten, battered, and dragged people into her pool, but her attack on Ken Peters was unimaginable. Even though SeaWorld had witnessed orca attacks in the past, it was nothing new. Katsuka, for all her tantrums, was never expected to go that far, but something had agitated the orca at that very moment causing her to lose it and ravage Ken Peters. The public saw the video, the full video, and it was way more dramatic than I had been led to believe. Katsuka was not just the star of SeaWorld San Diego. She was the matriarch of the marine park. Katsuka was the first captive killer whale to conceive from artificial insemination, giving birth to almost 11 babies in captivity. Now that makes her a celebrity, but just like Tilikum, a notorious rebel orca who often made headlines with his aggression, Katsuka was no less. Katsuka was captured off the coast of Iceland on October 26, 1978. She was a young two-year-old female, swimming happily with friend Kahana when both were ambushed and housed in a sea pen in Grindavik. Within a few months, Katsuka was sold to SeaWorld, where she was made to live in training captivity. While Katsuka went through her training routines well enough to be turned into a performing well, she was not very happy there. And when you are taken from an environment with endless water and made to live in a tiny little tank just a little bit bigger than you, mental trauma and frustration will set in. The first warning signs of Katsuka's aggression manifested in 1993, and ironically, it was Ken Peters who she chose as her first victim. Katsuka tried tearing into Peters, while orcas may not possess the razor-sharp teeth of sharks, they remain fully capable of wrecking brutal and catastrophic havoc. Luckily, Peters got away, and as incredible and astonishing as it sounds, Katsuka again tried biting Peters in 1999. Now, what was going on? Here was this gigantic whale who seemed to have formed a bond with one of the most experienced trainers in SeaWorld. She performed well with Peters in the water, and both were veterans of the marine park. Did Katsuka see Peter as nothing more than a plaything or maybe a potential prey? Orcas have this sadistic habit of toying with their game in the water. They will toss around dolphins, seals, and even sharks playing water rugby with them. Besides Peters, 
There were other incidents involving Katsuka, but Peters was clearly her favorite, whom she had constantly been trying to have a go at. On November 30th, 2006, Katsuka got her chance and took it. It was a fabulous sunny day at SeaWorld San Diego, and as usual, they were packed crowds. Ken Peters was getting ready for his performance with Katsuka. The female orca was on her best behavior, or was it all an act where she had something sinister going on in her mind? Peters was getting Katsuka ready. He had signaled her to come onto the pool surface, as was the traditional entry, while another trainer stood at the side clapping and pepping up the crowd. Peters hugged Katsuka, after which the whale just side splashed into the water. She looked like she was truly enjoying herself, and Peters did too. The whale then bobbed out of the water and gave Peters the nose greeting, and frankly, from the perspective of an audience, that looked adorable. It was then Peters' turn to get into the water, and he dove into the pool. Ken Peters might have been the oldest trainer in SeaWorld, but he loved his job. He was enthusiastic about every performance. Despite having been attacked in the past by Katsuka, he never harbored a grudge and regarded it as just a whale having an off day. Peter submerged below the surface, ready to perform the favorite stunt enjoyed by trainers and that was to emerge from the water, standing on the whale's snout. It thrilled the crowd as well. Something went wrong though. Where was Peter's? As Peter's disappeared into the pool, trainers on the edge waited anxiously to see him surface, but he did not. After a minute or so, there was a brief hint and a sigh of relief as they saw the large black shadow of Katsuka rising. But then something terrifying happened. Katsuka did not emerge entirely and instead, like a crocodile, spiraled into a death row, thrashing Peters as she did so. At that moment, Peters was briefly taken aback by what was happening. Why did Katsuka throw him over? Before he could recompose himself, Katsuka grabbed Peters by the foot and tossed him around briefly before submerging again. By now, more trainers had gathered onto the pool's edge. Some were terrified. There have been several incidents of unpredictable orca behavior in SeaWorld branches across the country, most at Orlando and SeaWorld. Just eight years ago, a young trainer, Kelty Byrne, was killed by Nuka 4, a male orca at Sealand on the Pacific of Victoria, British Columbia. Katsuka too had known to attack trainers, had she finally gone over the edge. It was an agonizing 30 second wait for the people just watching the swirling water, not knowing what was happening with Peters in the pool. Horrifying underwater video footage revealed how Katsuka had Peter's foot in her mouth. She kept dragging him around and if it continued for longer, Peter's would not have survived. There is no way of knowing how long a trainer can withstand such trauma underwater. Fortunately, Katsuka resurfaced and Peter's was seen doing the unthinkable. He was rubbing the orca's back and trying to calm the killer whale down, despite being injured. Katsuka just wouldn't give up on Peters, who was dragged down again a couple more times. Finally, when Katsuka let go, Peters made a dash to swim for his life. Katsuka, enraged, possibly at his escape, followed him. She was not done with Peters, and knowing an orca, play things usually end up in a kill. It was Peters' only chance, and he took it. As unbearable as it was, his foot bleeding, his body bitten, he swam possibly the fastest swim of his life. Luckily, Katsuka was obstructed by several buoys thrown in the water by trainers trying to distract her. Peters made it and was quickly pulled onto the edge of the pool by the others. After reaching safety, his body gave way and he just collapsed on the wet tiles out of exhaustion. Thankfully, Peters was not severely injured. His foot was broken and there were teeth marks on various parts of his body. The incident involving Ken Peters was taken seriously by federal authorities. Too many incidents were occurring involving killer whales, and there had already been one death. Peters had very narrowly escaped with his life, but when he testified, he acknowledged the risk of performing with such dangerous animals. An investigation of the sequence of events finally deduced that the possible reason for Katsuka's weird behavior was that she had heard one of her babies calling out to her in distress. Both Peters and Katsuka went back to performing, although it was unlikely that Peters ever ventured into the pool with her again. It was just too much of a risk. Katsuka was euthanized at the age of 41. While SeaWorld played it down as a standard procedure for aged and dying mammals, former trainer John Hargrove spilt the beans 
saying her bacterial infection was not acquired suddenly, but due to being confined in a tiny pool that compromised her immunity. SeaWorld claimed that it was educating people in the 90s, but was that really the truth? Captive orcas lived in brutal and horrifying conditions, but how many from the crowd knew that? We may never know. Kelty Byrne was a strong competitive swimmer, but none of her training could manage the brute force of three killer whales. They toyed with her and mauled her till she drowned. The terrifying trio was led by the notorious Tilikin. Poor Kelty was bruised, battered, and beaten as these three killer orcas viciously dragged her underwater over and over again. Kelty was heard screaming and pleading for her life until her final breath. This is the story of Kelty Byrne, the first victim of Tilikin, history's most notorious killer whale in captivity. Kelty Lee Byrne was a good-natured girl who loved wildlife especially marine animals. The 20-year-old biology student from the University of Victoria had decided to join the now-defunct Sealand in British Columbia. Kelty wanted to experience working with whales while also earning some extra money to begin life as a young woman. Kelty was desperate to get up close with orcas, whom she regarded as the most impressive beast on the planet, and working for Sealand was her dream job. In the 90s, Sealand of the Pacific attracted huge crowds because of the orcas, Sealand opened in 1969 and kept several captive orcas, including their first, a female called Haida. None of the orcas took the captivity, and soon most died until Sealand finally got the terrible trio, a male named Tilikum and two females, Noka 4 and Haida 2. The three orcas had been captured from eastern Iceland, and though they were housed together, the other two females bullied Tilikum night after night. On several occasions, he was found battered, bruised, and bleeding. What made matters worse was how the three whales were kept in metal pods just 26 feet across and 20 feet deep. Tilikum was a massive 22-foot orca, so if he stood vertical in the pod, he would stick out of the water, and yet, this was their home for 14 hours a day. Besides the bruises from the fights, all three orcas would often be found with scratches and cuts from rubbing their sides against the metal pods. But that was just part of their misery. The three orcas were made to perform seven days a week, eight hours a day, and slowly, the pressure and trauma took their toll. Tilikum was never a normal whale. Even though he hated captivity, he was strangely still a playful beast, youthful and eager to learn. Most of the trainers at Sealand loved working with him instead of the other two. Because he was so young, Tilikum often struggled with commands, and because of this, food was denied to all three. Perhaps this is why the whales hated Tilikum and abused him, as well as showing additional signs of discontent. Nuka had already bitten one of the trainers, including a blind woman in the audience who was asked to pet her. To protect Tilikum from Nuka and Haida, Seelin kept him in a separate pod, but being smaller, it only made matters worse. The first warnings of how Tilikum was slowly turning psychotic came from biologist Eric Walters. Walters shot off screeching letters to the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies highlighting the safety concerns he had about the aquarium. The issue was really that we stored these whales at night in what we call a module, and the lights were all turned out. So there's really no stimulation. They're just in this dark metal 20-foot by 30-foot pool. Eric remarked that Sealand was not providing the orcas with any type of new stimulation and knew that eventually these killer whales would crack. His chilling warnings gradually began taking shape as Tilikum displayed possessive behavior grabbing anything that fell in the pod and refusing to give it up. On February 20th, 1991, the three whales seized the chance when they found Kelty Byrne had fallen into the pool. For them, it was like, oh look, the human wants to play. They were certainly not going to miss the opportunity, especially Tilikum, who went wild. Kelty Byrne was enjoying her job at Sealand and was proving to be a diligent worker. She loved the orcas, but was still not allowed to swim or interact with them. It was the afternoon and a few shows had just finished. Kelty's job was clearing the pool when disaster struck. The audience had not left yet, and several hundred people were still in their seats watching as Kelty suddenly slipped and fell halfway into the pool. For a trainer, falling into the pool was no big deal, and halfway in is also halfway out. All she needed was to pull herself up. As Kelty gripped the sides and tried pulling herself up, she felt something forceful tugging at her body. It was Tilikum, 
who caught Kelty by her foot and pulled her back in. Kelty became the stimulation the whales needed, but for the trainers and other eyewitnesses, it was a dangerous development. Kelty had to be brought out immediately or it could turn fatal. With Kelty in his mouth, Tillicum raced around the pool, dragging her underwater and surfacing again. Head trainer Steve Huckster, who witnessed the incident, remarked later, they never had a plaything in the pool that was so interactive. They just got incredibly excited and stimulated. Yes, indeed, Kelty was nothing but a live toy. And the more she thrashed around and tried to save herself, the more it excited the whales, who all joined in the fun. For Kelty, it was a nightmare. All her dreams were being dashed right before her eyes as she knew somehow this could be the end. The three whales took turns, grabbing her each time she broke free. They did not allow her to get to the side of the pool. Tillicum was the most violent, yet in terms of whale speak, this was just horsing around and nothing more. After all, this would be the standard way of playing with prey in a pod of whales, especially large seals. And there was Kelty, a struggling human. Cold trainer Karen McGee, standing on the side of the pool with other trainers, watched in horror as Tillicum battered Kelty. As he rose above the water surface with her, she saw Kelty wave frantically, screaming her name, saying, Help me, I don't want to die. At this point, Karen threw a life ring out to Kelty, who tried grabbing it, but Tillicum would not let her. Several trainers began clanging buckets and throwing fish in the water to distract the whales, but nothing worked. Tillicum was having the time of his life. All the bullying, the pent-up frustration, and the trauma was now erupting in a moment of frenzied and violent playfulness. A large net was thrown in to try and separate Kelty from the whales. Still, it possibly backfired, causing the whales to remain underwater longer, a deadly development for Kelty's survival. The other trainers began leaning over the side of the pool and saw how the three whales bounced Kelty around underwater. She was being rammed against the sides, a sure sign that her bones were fractured. The poor woman was being killed slowly and painfully. When Tillicum rose one final time with Kelty, she was still conscious. She screamed one last time for help and then disappeared underwater again. This time, she couldn't hold out any longer. In the next few moments, Kelty died. The coroner termed it forceful drowning. Eventually, after two hours of being bored with a dead plaything, Tillicum let Kelty go. When Kelty's body was recovered from the pool with the help of a net, she looked terrible. Her injuries were horrendous. Kelty suffered several fractures, punctured organs, and lacerations across her body. It was truly a sad day, and ironically, one could not blame the animals for their actions. Speaking to reporters, Sealand manager Alejandro Bolt reported she had 10 tooth marks on her body, the largest on her left thigh, but otherwise untouched. The whales had stripped her clothes off. It was just a tragic accident. In stark contrast to what the eyewitness reports had stated, Sealand downplayed the incident and released an official report. The incident shocked many and enraged animal activists worldwide. Commenting on how the deplorable conditions and mismanagement of such large beasts in captivity were responsible for their gruesome behavior, Kelty's death, however, triggered a moment that finally led to the closure of Sealand of the Pacific. Yet it did not lead to the freeing of the whales. SeaWorld of Orlando seized the opportunity and purchased Tillicum to protect the whale. The water park in Orlando gave Tillicum another platform to kill again, and he repeated the feat two more times. Although Tillicum died years later from the disease, he would go down as the most famous orca whale in marine park history, and the only whale to have caused the deaths of multiple people. Kelty Byrne, Daniel Duke, and another trainer, Don Bracho. The murder of Bracho was far more disturbing than what had happened to Kelty. It made sensational news and finally led to governments cracking down on breeding orcas in captivity. Today, the debate rages on whether marine parks like SeaWorld should be allowed to use orcas as performing animals. Like Sealand in the Pacific, SeaWorld has always chosen to keep a tight lid against controversies. Even the incident concerning Don Percho was attributed to only drowning. Should children today be educated on why such entertainment is wrong for humans and animals? Perhaps with awareness, more and more people will stop witnessing such shows. But until that time comes, places like SeaWorld will continue using orcas despite the controversy. But Kelty Byrne was simply the first of Tillicum's victims. 
Daniel Dukes must have regretted his crazy stunt when he was pulled down by his scrotum into the tank of one of the most notorious killer whales in history. As a petty drug abuser and trespasser, Dukes was known for doing crazy things in life. The man who appeared deranged to witnesses thought he could break into SeaWorld, swim with an orca, and escape. What he then bargained for was Tilikum, the beloved orca that slaughtered him in such a vicious and painstaking way. The monster whale attacked him violently when Dukes jumped into the pool. Dukes was battered and thrashed around the pool, bitten and bruised. At one point, Tilikum caught hold of his scrotum and dragged him down. When he drowned, the whale tore it off completely. When they found his body, Dukes was left totally unrecognizable. What possessed Daniel Dukes to trespass in the sea world is anybody's guess. Eyewitnesses reported Dukes mumbling to himself while hanging around the entrance to SeaWorld. This was one last break-in that finally got the better of him. Dukes was a troubled man with a history of drug abuse. One particular report in the Orlando Sentinel described Dukes as a marijuana-smoking drifter from South Carolina with a string of petty arrests. While he wasn't considered violent, most arrests included drug possession, petty theft, and trespassing. Dukes didn't fit in with society and was regarded as having several issues. He was also prone to impulsive behavior and was reported to be obsessed with the game Ultima. In March of 1996, he even broke into the home of the game's creator, Richard Garriott, who fired a gun at Dukes as a warning. Instead of being scared, Dukes walked up to Garriott's bedroom, stripped himself, and tucked himself into Garriott's bed. It was there that police arrested him when they responded to a 911 call from Garriott. His neighbors described him as a gentle person who loved nature. One priest of a Hare Krishna temple near Dukes' home claimed he often fed homeless people and loved feeding wild birds. One woman named Susan wrote online that Dukes was a clean-cut, happy-go-lucky kid who had a great sense of humor. He was a good student and her friend. From the mixed responses, it was clear that Dukes had two very different personalities. Sadly, one got the better of him the day he decided to break into SeaWorld. On July 6, 1999, Dukes was seen hanging around the gates of SeaWorld, where eyewitnesses said he looked dirty. He was talking to himself and reeked of a foul odor. Just a few days before he was seen at SeaWorld, Dukes had spent three days in jail for stealing a Three Musketeers bar. Some of the witnesses who provided sworn testimonies said Dukes' attire was questionable, while others said he was wandering around the front gate plaza, glaring suspiciously at young girls. The eyewitnesses' statements proved that Dukes was not in a clear frame of mind. His urge to break into an establishment was too much. He just had to do it. Dukes managed to get into the marine park and strip. He had swimming shorts beneath his trousers, which suggests he had planned his reckless stunt all along. Unfortunately, though, he chose to dive into the tank of the most notorious killer whale in the history of marine entertainment. Dukes was unaware of Tilikum, the killer whale, who showed no mercy when he wanted to kill. Tilikum was an 11-ton orca whose 22-foot frame made him look like a monster in his tank. He was a tragic victim of circumstance, a whale who never took kindly to captivity. The killer whale was captured back in 1983 in Iceland and was brought to SeaWorld in Orlando in 1992. Tilikum's transition from the vast expanse of the ocean to living in a tank was a nightmare. His training was fraught with incidents of rebellion, inviting the wrath of other orcas who repeatedly beat him up. Tilikum's frustration and pent-up rage exploded when he killed his first victim, female trainer Kelty Byrne, in 1991. On July 6, 1999, Tilikum was probably pacing around in his pool. It had been 13 years since his capture, yet he could not get used to being docile in his tin can of a home. Trainers were extremely careful with Tilikum. They knew the orca had tasted blood once, and there was no way of knowing if he would ever go berserk again. Yet. Daniel Dukes unknowingly gave him a chance to prove what a killer Tilikum could be. Whether the security cameras captured the incident is unknown, but Dukes waited for the crowd to disperse. As soon as it grew dark, he broke into the marine park and made a straight beeline for the orca tank. In his mind, he was living out one more escapade, another adventure. He could get caught or he might not. 
He didn't realize that this would be the last break-in of his entire life. As soon as Dukes jumped in the Tillicum's tank, he may have yelled. Who wouldn't? After all, the water in the tank was a chilly 50 degrees and icy cold. Sensing the sudden movement in the water, it was doubtful Tillicum gave Dukes a warning. They are trained to understand when it is performing time and when it's not. This was not the case, nor was it common practice for humans to enter the tank at this time. This was different, so he was not required to comply with commands, and neither a whistle nor any other order was forthcoming. He was free to do whatever he pleased to the person who jumped into his tank, and with that possible thought, Tillicum attacked. Dukes had no chance and wasn't rational enough to even realize that a 22-foot killer whale was about to maul him. From his injuries, it was evident that the orca battered him, most likely with his snout. The impact of being rammed by a killer whale of this size would be enough to break Dukes' ribs, knocking him out cold. No human can withstand the force of 12,000 pounds. Dukes' bones must have shattered instantly. The whale then caught Dukes by the unlikeliest of places, his scrotum dragged him down to the bottom of the pool. One can only imagine the amount of torturous pain in that moment that Dukes felt. Sadly, Tillicum wasn't entirely done. The hunt had just begun. If captive orcas attack have taught us anything, it is that they are not satisfied with their victims, even after they're dead. Tillicum then played brutally with Dukes' body, thrashing him like a rag doll, biting him, and almost churning him into putty. The next day, when the marine park trainers came around for the morning routine, the sight of Tillicum's pool horrified them. On the back of Tillicum laid the lifeless resemblance of what looked to be a human. The killer whale was proudly parading around in his pool with his new prize, and try as they might, he did not let any of the trainers near him. Eventually, Tillicum was manipulated to give up the body of Dukes, and it was shocking what the trainers found. Dukes was unrecognizable. He had lacerations, abrasions, and bruises all over his body. The most terrifying sight of all was his lower body. He had no genitals. They had been completely bent off. Dukes' face was a mess. He looked so bizarre that his funeral had to be held in a closed casket. Unlike the first incident where Tillicum killed his trainer, the one concerning Dukes created a sensation. It was the first time the orca killed an outsider. The official report detailed how a nearly psychotic man and trespasser with little regard for his own safety drowned in a killer whale's tank. The orca's attack on Dukes may have been caught on camera, along with confirmed images of the orca swimming around with Dukes on his back, but SeaWorld has yet to release them. Daniel Dukes was indeed a troubled individual with a record of petty crimes. Still, being a human being, he will instead be remembered as Tillicum's second victim in the first significant incident at SeaWorld. The incident concerning Dukes did not do much to make SeaWorld sit up and take notice. In 2010, Tillicum would kill again in a manner that would shock the entire world. In front of a live audience, Tillicum would attack and kill trainer Don Pachoa, revealing a dark side to the orca, who thought nothing of attacking someone he had trained with for several weeks. The big question is, who is to blame? Is it Tillicum's fault? As one expert put it, these magnificent giant marine mammals live the equivalent of a human life in a prison cell without being a convict. The whales got bored and when they do, they kill for sport, just like in the ocean. Be it a shark, a dolphin, or a human, they are different. Do you agree that such large animals should not be kept in captivity because the inevitable is bound to happen? When star trainer Alexis Martinez was dragged underwater by Cato, the killer whale, he knew for certain he was living his last moments on Earth. Just minutes before, their training session hit off to a great start. It was just a routine session at Laura Park Zoo in the Canary Islands. Both man and beast knew each other well. They needed to make their Christmas Eve show special, but suddenly, the whale became the killer it was known to be. Alexis did not even get time to surface as the 6,600-pound orca rammed into him battering his vital organs and dragging him deeper into the tank. Not satisfied, the orca crushed his bones as trainers watched from above, waiting for Alexis to surface. This is the tragic tale of Alexis Martinez, a man who wanted nothing but to live his dream of working with killer whales. 
The tragic death of Alexis Martinez by Cato the killer whale was terrifying. It stunned the trainers and eyewitnesses trying to figure out what was happening. Both Martinez and Cato had always looked so good together, so what went wrong? The Christmas Eve show is always a crowd puller at SeaWorld, and who better at the showstopper than Alexis Martinez and his favorite orca, Cato? Everyone knew them as friends. They were considered the best and had performed several shows without incident. It was 2009, just three years into Alexis Martinez's career, and his routine with Cato was chosen for the Christmas Eve show, an event always reserved for the most reliable performers. It was Alexis's big challenge and the ultimate test of his career. However, something in him picked at his brain. He wasn't quite ready for it. A few days earlier, he confided in his fiancée, Estonia, saying he was so tired. Alexis even revealed how the killer whales were growing disobedient, disruptive, and aggressive. It seemed that Alexis knew something bad was coming, but he didn't expect he would end up being the victim of his own gut feeling. Alexis Martinez grew up in Spain and had loved animals since he was a young boy. However, in 2004, he became ecstatic when he learned the zoo would receive four orcas from SeaWorld. These whales would soon become part of the new ocean world at Lower Parca and would be performing as well. Alexis applied for the orca training program and was accepted. As he learned the ropes, he grew accustomed to the whales and soon became a popular trainer with the animals. Little did he realize how his dream would soon come to a tragic end. Alexis gained a lot of experience at Laura Park as an orca trainer. His fiance, Estonia Rodriguez, said he was completely committed to his job. Alexis worked tirelessly at the Orca Ocean Department so that his routines would be perfect with these beautiful beasts. He soon became a favorite with the crowds and Laura Parker soon became a popular destination for tourists in Tenerife. Alexis, now an accomplished trainer, was the leading performer in showcasing the mighty killer whales and the awesome tricks that they were trained to do. It was Alexis who took charge of the rehearsals for every show. The staff at the park liked Alexis. He was a cooperative and courteous young man. As Alexis grew closer to the orcas, he realized the unseen problems associated with the job. Alexis began observing how the killer whales weren't entirely happy while other staff denied that there was something wrong with the whales. He began to have safety concerns about them and noticed that they were becoming restless. The whales were not responding to commands like before, especially Cato. Cato was a 6,600-pound 6, orca born in 1995 in captivity in SeaWorld. All his life, he knew nothing except living in a claustrophobic tank and entertaining crowds across the USA. In 2006, Cato suddenly found himself being transported a huge distance across the ocean to Laura Park. Unlike other whales captured from the ocean, Cato did not show much aggression, nor did he ever show signs of distress or rebellion. On December 24, 2009, Alexis found Cato in a good mood. That was a good sign. It would make Alexis' job easier. He entered the tank, swimming alongside Cato as he had always done before. He wanted the training session to go smoothly, making sure everything was right. He instructed other staff members around the enclosure to pick up any unwelcome gestures, but there were none. Rehearsing alongside with Alexis was fellow trainer Brian Rokich, who positioned himself on the stage. The move Alexis attempted to rehearse was common. It had been done in SeaWorld several times. It was an awesome sight. He would dive underwater with Cato, hunting on the whale's nose. It would look like a majestic and dramatic sight, like Aquaman emerging from his marine kingdom. It was all going well until suddenly Cato acted strangely. He began disobeying commands and refusing the cues. And with no warning, he just stopped performing as he should have. He kept bobbing up and down in the water alongside Alexis. Alexis tried to stun again, but tumbled as Cato leaned to one side. Alexis wondered why Cato was misbehaving. He knew it was possible, regardless of years of training, an orca is still a wild beast. They too, like all wild animals, can become unpredictable. Alexis did not realize how Cato was about to transform from Cato the Orca to Cato the Killer. Brian then shouted a command to Cato, which he obeyed. The whale was promptly rewarded with a bucket of fish. That did give Alexis hope and he tried again. He would ride Cato down into the tank and then pull up onto the stage. The whale dragged him deeper into the 14-meter enclosure as soon as he went under. 
it forced Alexis to abandon the dive. At that moment, even the best trainer would never have expected he was being toyed with as a prey. When Alexis emerged from the water and attempted to climb out of the pool, Cato blocked the way. That move must have sent a cold, chilling shiver down Alexis' spine. Alexis Martinez might have even guessed that he was about to die. Alexis waited for Cato to calm down and begin swimming towards the pool's edge. Yet again, Cato blocked his path. The giant killer whale leaned into the trainer, just as a killer whale in the wild leans into its victims, trapping them so they can't escape. By now, alarm bells had to have been ringing in Alexis's ear. Something was wrong, and he had to escape the tank fast. His life depended on it. He requested a stage call via underwater tone, but something still needed to be done. Cato was not responding. He had ceased to become a whale in captivity. His sole intent was now to kill. The other trainers as well understood the gravity of the situation. Something had to be done. They tried using emergency signals, hoping the agitated whale would stop. But Cato didn't. He was enraged and angry. Years of frustration and anger were unleashed upon Alexis in one barbaric moment as he began headbutting Alexis to the bottom of the pool. No one could do anything. No one would dare get into the water at that moment. When a killer whale goes berserk, there is little a human can do. As Alexis sank deeper, Cato waited momentarily and rammed the trainer with his snout. That first deadly blow might have been as fatal as every organ in Alexis' body was torn apart. It is tragic. But perhaps if Alexis did die in that decisive moment, he was fortunate because the killer whale was not done. Not yet. Cato tore into Alexis again, crushing all his bones in the process. As if showing off his kill, Cato surfaced with the lifeless body of the young trainer balancing on the tip of his nose. He then dropped it, and Alexis' body again drifted down to the bottom of the pool. Cato prevented trainers from entering the pool by stalling them at the gate. Alexis' training and skill could not save him from the onslaught of the ferocious beast playing around with his body at the bottom of the tank. What went wrong that ill-fated Christmas Eve at Laura Park? The bloody incident instigated fear in all the other trainers. None of them ever got into the tank with orcas again. Laura Park's orcas entertainment was unofficially ended. The park authorities tried hushing up the sword affair by stating that it was a case of drowning, but the autopsy spoke a different story. Alexis's vital organs were like putty. His bones were crushed and his body was compressed and fractured. There were several bite marks all over him. Former Sea World trainer Jeffrey Varchese felt the whale acted out of intense frustration of not being rewarded despite giving its best. Apparently, its trainers didn't think so and withheld its reward, which cost him his life. The tragedy, regarded as unprecedented, was soon overshadowed a few months later when trainer Darn Bacho was bruised and battered to death by the notorious rebel orca Tilikum. It seemed the death of Alexis did not initiate action then. Still, it soon became part of why the orca breeding and marine entertainment was stopped. Do you think using wild animals with killer instincts to entertain people is justified? Is there ever any second chance? We may never know, but make sure to check the next video that will reveal the untold horrors behind Darn Bacho's orca attack. From the moment she set eyes on Shamu at SeaWorld, 10-year-old Dawn Brancho decided she wanted to work at SeaWorld. Three decades later, she was being dragged mercilessly by Tilikum, the orca, into his tank. What triggered the ruthless attack on Dawn still puzzles the experts, but for Brancho, it was an agonizing way to go as the 22-foot killer whale treated her like a piece of meat. He thrashed her against the side of the tank relentlessly, breaking her bones and mutilating her until he felt her body go limp in his mouth. Even then, he wouldn't allow others near her. Dawn was Tilikum's third victim. This was never what she bargained for. This is the tragic true story of Dawn Brancho, the Sea World trainer whose death changed everything. Dawn Brancho was one of the most popular and loved trainers at Sea World in Orlando. She was their poster child and always a star attraction at every show. Beside the marine animals, Dawn raked in millions for SeaWorld, and her performances with orcas were the main attraction. Her Shamu show with Tilikum especially became world famous. Tilikum was used to Dawn, and even shared a good rapport with her. The giant killer whale, 
had been a performing orca at SeaWorld for 18 years, two years longer than when Dawn worked there. They were partners and the oldest workers there too, yet strangely their partnership ended in one of the worst tragedies that shocked the country. Dawn was born and raised in Cedar Lake, Indiana. When she was 10, her family took her on vacation to Orlando. Seeing the performance of Shamu at SeaWorld mesmerized Dawn. It changed her life forever. The majestic beauty of the orcas created an obsession for her and animals. She just had to work with them. In one interview, Dawn was quoted as saying, I remember walking down the aisle at Shamu Stadium and telling my mom, this is what I want to do. It was her dream to do it, said Marion Laverde, Brancho's mother. She loved her job. Soon after graduating from the University of South Carolina in psychology and animal behavior, Dawn began volunteering in animal shelters. She loved animals and kept two Labradors, stray ducks, chickens, rabbits, and birds at home. Dawn's love for animals finally landed her a job working with dolphins at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey. In 1994, Dawn finally found her dream job at SeaWorld in Orlando. Dawn's role in SeaWorld grew into an important one. To manage the intense rigors of working with killer orcas, Dawn ensured she was physically fit and active. She ran marathons, participated in cycling races, and even pumped iron. Dawn became a leader, taking charge of the famous Shamu shows in SeaWorld. Dawn breathed new life into the Shamu show and became featured on billboards across Orlando. Ever since the first original Shamu debuted in SeaWorld, Orca always took its place, becoming an heir to the most popular brand in animal entertainment. When Dawn joined SeaWorld, Tillicum was still a newcomer, brought to SeaWorld Orlando in 1992. Tillicum, a 22-foot monster killer whale, was always a rebel. Right from his capture off the coast of Iceland in 1983 to he was sent to SeaWorld in 1992, he was never truly broken in. Tillicum lived in Sealand for eight years. He was so notoriously disobedient that he would even get picked on by other whales for not behaving. When one orca displays disobedience, the entire pod at a marine park will go without food. The other orcas recognized how Tillicum was often the cause of their ill treatment, and they often thrashed him. On more than one occasion, Tillicum was found badly injured by other orcas. Adding to his problems was the little tanks meant for orcas. This was a creature taken from his environment, used to living in the vast expanse of an ocean, now made to exist in the solitary confines of a tin can. Tillicum was like a ticking time bomb waiting to explode, and was tragically in the presence of Don Brancho that he did. At SeaWorld, Tillicum's life was no different. Pacific Northwest whales, who regarded him as an outsider, battered and bruised him. When Tillicum and Don met, the human and beast instantly developed a rapport. It was evident that Don was Tillicum's favorite human, and they developed a close bond. Senior trainer John Hargrove remarked, he had a great relationship with her, and she had a great relationship with him. I do believe that he loved her, and I know that she loved him. On the sad day of February 24, 2010, Tillicum and Dawn were performing their famous Dining with Shamu show at SeaWorld. Beside an audience on the surface, hundreds were below witnessing the show through see-through glass in an open-air dining area. Everything was going as rehearsed. Dawn and Tillicum had done the show several times. It was all part of the job. Once they finished, Dawn laid on her stomach on the edge of the tank and began a nose-to-nose -nose routine with Tillicum. Her long ponytail floated in the water and struck Tillicum's nose. No one is sure if this triggered his rage, but at that moment, Tillicum dragged Dawn into the water. Tillicum was no stranger to killing. He had already killed two trainers in the past. In 1991, he killed a young, inexperienced trainer, Kelty Bird. In 1999, he killed 27-year-old trainer Daniel Dukes, who was so severely mutilated that there was not a single part of his body without injury. Even his genitals were bitten off. To get into the water with Tillicum and bond with him was extremely courageous of Dawn, but she eventually paid the price. The horror that unfolded at SeaWorld wasn't just caught on camera. Below the surface, hundreds of terrified tourists witnessed a horror movie come to life. People being served their cuisine felt too sick to touch their food as they saw Tillicum began battering Dawn. The five foot four ton whale dragged her deeper and began drowning her. Witnesses said he would not allow her to rise to the surface. Each time she broke free and tried swimming up for air, he dragged her back down. 
Tilikum began violently shaking Dawn's body. At times, he grabbed and shook her by the arm. Sometimes, he shook her by the leg. One witness described how he even thrashed and shook her around by the head. As Dawn tried escaping, he battered her with his snout. At one point, just when Dawn thought she had a chance and scrambled with all her strength towards the surface, Tilikum swam straight into her like a battering ram, hitting her squarely in the chest. Even as Dawn went limp from the impact, Tilikum went around the pool in return, swimming at full speed towards her with his mouth open. It was as if the whale was battering a victim, his prey. People were witnessing the live mutilation of Dawn as Tilikum snapped off her arm and began chewing on it. This was even scarier than any scene from Jaws because this was being played out in real life. It was not color in the water but real blood. Dawn's blood that oozed in the mouth of Tilikum as he ate her arm. As if that wasn't enough, the whale chewed at her head and tore her scalp right off. People began screaming and yet no one could do anything. The cruel and merciless battering broke Dawn's jaw and one ear was seen dangling from her face. Her knees were broken. She could no longer move as her arms were fractured as well. Tilikum was a monster gone crazy. There were other smaller whales in the pool, but none participated in the bloody massacre. Meanwhile, the staff quickly swung into action, segregated the other whales into a neighboring pool, and attempted to save Dawn. Dawn was already dead. It was impossible to survive the battering she was receiving from Tilikum. Even as her body remained limp and lifeless, the whale was not done thrashing her around. Later, the coroner found that even Dawn's spinal cord had snapped and was severed in the attack. The entire staff at SeaWorld began slapping the water in hopes of intimidating Tilikum, who continued to thrash Dawn in his jaws. Paramedic Thomas Tobin rushed to the scene, but it was pointless. After 30 minutes, Tilikum was isolated in a special medical pool with a hydraulic base. Only then did trainers dive into the water to retrieve Dawn's body. One of the trainers found she had no scalp and dove back into the water only to find laying at the bottom of the pool. As Dawn was being removed from the water, Tilikum looked agitated and tried getting back at her. It seemed the beast just wanted to rip her to shreds. Dawn was placed next to another pool, covered in a black sheet. Witnesses report seeing Tilikum repeatedly approaching the surface, trying to lift himself above the pool wall. Experts still can't pinpoint what happened to Tilikum and what triggered such rage in the orca. Some feel he had mistaken Dawn's ponytail for a toy but was that really the case? The incident involving Don Bracho prompted a documentary called Blackfish, Death at SeaWorld, where marine scientists attempted to analyze and explain the event. They felt that Tilikum was angered for not being rewarded after the show. The most logical and likely explanation was that Tilikum had snapped after 26 years of living in captivity, suffering beatings and being traumatized by the confines of his captive environment. Do you agree that marine animals as large as Tilikum should never live in captivity and be trained for human entertainment? Was Don Brancho's merciless killing a disaster waiting to happen? We may never know, but remember, Don was the third victim of Tilikum. Check out the next video on screen to see some of the others.